nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and the gas industry, meeting America's future energy needs by providing abundant supplies of clean, natural gas for this generation and for generations to come. And by Siemens, a leader in electronics and electrical engineering, 27,000 employees, 47 manufacturing facilities. The name is Siemens. It's said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for us humans, a rushing mountain stream is one of nature's more beautiful and relaxing sights. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and this is a salmon stream. And our film about the salmon is one of the most unusual we've ever had on nature, because most of it was actually filmed from the salmon's point of view. But this stream, so beautiful to us, is just one part of a life or death obstacle course for a salmon in its great migratory voyage that is one of nature's most amazing journeys. The determination of salmon to return to their native rivers where they will spawn and die is legendary. We tell that famous story again, but this time following an individual fish as she fights her way past waterfalls, the assorted weaponry of man the fisherman, and a host of predators. She moves upstream. Danger is everywhere. Each shadow above can harbor a death blow. This dramatic story is about North America's most valuable and prolific species of Pacific salmon. It's called the sockeye, and it's red. From their birthplace in the Adams River among the Shuswap Hills in British Columbia, the sockeye of our story travel to the far reaches of the Pacific Ocean and then return to spawn and die in the same beautiful little river. A 6,000 mile journey of incessant danger. It all starts in October with an egg, one of 3,000 that were laid and buried by one of the female sockeyes in a nest of gravel in the Adams River. As soon as eggs appear, predators move in. Mergansers dive and dive again to clean up the surplus. And even the little dipper, which can dive and actually walk on the bottom, will work its way into the gravel nest to steal an egg.
but most of the eggs stay securely hidden. And protected from sunlight in its gravel pocket, our egg begins to develop. Gradually, signs of life appear as the tiny creature inside starts to form. After about a month comes the first recognizable feature, the black dot of a rudimentary eye. The heart is beating strongly now, pushing the blood cells to all parts of the body. A great blood vessel runs through the center of the yolk sac that contains the food on which the little salmon lives. And in February, an enzyme dissolves the encapsulating wall and releases the tiny creature, now called an alevin, from her circular prison. In May, her yolk sac absorbed, the alevin becomes a fry. Now she must leave the gravel and reach the food supply in the stream above. She struggles from the stony sanctuary, up into the light. She pushes her way free and instantly is whisked off by the current to join the schools of fry that have already hatched. But it's not long before she's on the move downstream. After hatching, young sockeye salmon, unlike other salmon species, head for a nearby lake. It's in still water, not the river, that most of them spend their first 12 months before going to sea. And so, as one of a great school of fry, our little fish finds her way into Shuswap Lake. The lake is a nursery of good feeding for the tiny salmon, but full of threat. Swimming on through a maze of weed stems, our little fish finds the battle for life or death as ruthless as in the fast-flowing river she's just left. Eat and be eaten. Already belted kingfishers, mergansers, golden eye and bufflehead ducks have taken their toll of tiny sockeye. Now young coho salmon and trout chase and feed upon the massed schools of fry. And in turn, the trout are hunted by hungry otters. In the natural world of predators and prey, there are no rules. Each creature lives or dies on the whim of chance. But if she manages to survive, it's here in Shuswap Lake that our young salmon lives for the first year of her life. So in the spring, a year later, when the ospreys start to repair their nest, our fish in the lake below is about to start on the next stage of her fantastic journey. With the breakup of the ice and a rise in water temperature, the surviving millions of young sockeye leave the lake as smolts and head downstream. For our salmon, now about four inches long, 
the Thompson River is a constantly changing scene. Through shallows and deeps and racing torrents of white water, she swept ever seaward. Her first taste of turbulence. Out of control. Confused. She cannot see the predators lurking above. At last, the water's clear. She's made it through the rapids. Further downstream, the smolts emerge from the turbulence of the upper reaches and come into smooth water where they can adjust better to their surroundings, but only to face a new series of perils. Already, some of them have been eaten by garter snakes. Others lose their way and get trapped in a backwater, leaping in vain among a family of Canada geese. Most of them press safely on, although safety for a young salmon is never long-lasting. Suddenly, dark shapes block the light. The water tastes bitter. Logging is British Columbia's biggest industry, but there's a price to pay. Pollution, whether from the logging itself or from pulp mills or industry in general, is a poisonous barrier frequently faced by migrant fish. Here in the delta of the Fraser River, pollution comes from many sources, but the effect on the salmon is the same. She fights her way through the caustic, poisonous soup. She struggles to swim, struggles to breathe. Finally, clean, clear water. Different water. Now they are in the sea. The salmon adapt to changes in salinity by regulating the water and salt content of their blood, excreting excess salt through special cells that have formed in their gills. In the weird underwater world of a kelp forest, strange and dangerous creatures, bizarre in shape and color, lurk among the weeds and rocks. Our little fish find sanctuary for a short time among the waving stems, but a falling tide drives her into deeper water, past piers and jetties where weedy piles harbor more enemies. And further out wait voracious fur seals, tigers of the sea.
As the surviving sockeye smolts swim westward, the bottom falls away beneath them into the submerged vastness of the Pacific Ocean. This huge new world of the salmon is more than 70 million square miles in size, ranging from a few inches to seven miles in depth. Its islands still uncounted. Its population includes myriads of plankton, hordes of strange sea drifters. From the primitive jellyfish to big jellyfish-eating sunfish, their numbers are beyond our reckoning. Now the millions of young sockeye from the Adams River form a tiny part of that population. With each day as they swim through their seemingly endless world, the salmon become swifter and stronger. But the larger they grow, the more visible and attractive they become to larger predators. After three years at sea, moved by an urge to mate, the wandering salmon start the long, long journey home. On their way, the sockeyes join company with runs of Chinook, Coho, Pink, and Chum salmon. And among them all are the sockeyes destined for the Adams River. As they near the coast, where the line of freshwater outflow from the river meets the sea, it's their sense of smell that guides them to the rivers of their birth. The sense is so acute, it's believed they can smell one particle in a trillion. And soon, they come into direct conflict with their most dangerous of all enemies. Trolling with hook and line is a very old but effective form of fishing. About two and a half thousand boats troll for salmon off the British Columbia coast. This fisherman has already caught his government allowed quota of sockeye, so that this fish has to be released. But not every fish released will survive. Our fish has avoided the trolling lures and swims on beneath a group of sea lions. She senses danger. The fish around her panic. Fear. She smells it, tastes it in the water. She swims but can't escape. Lines bite into her sides. She's trapped.
For this female sockeye in her skin of sea silver, death seems inevitable. Or is it? In fact, she's been caught by the net of a research vessel. It's all part of a tagging program to gain more information about migration routes. Unharmed, she's released to swim away and rejoin the migrant schools heading up the Vancouver Channel. She was a lucky fish. For these salmon, caught in a commercial net, there will be no escape. Salmon fishermen catch between 16 and 22 million fish a year, most of them in nets. Staggering in its market potential, the salmon is a self-perpetuating resource of enormous value. Years ago, they were so prolific that the numbers of returning fish had seemed inexhaustible. At that time, although salmon fishing was a free-for-all, the boats and gear weren't effective enough to cause serious depletion of fish stocks. By contrast, modern salmon fleets are capable of catching entire runs of fish. Now, perhaps just in time, fishing by foreign fleets has been pushed back to 200 miles offshore. And a program has been started to try to restore salmon stocks to their former abundance. The plan has many elements. Fishways to help returning salmon past dams and weirs, salmon hatcheries, and limits on high seas netting. These boats are fishing the narrowing channel between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And keeping company with the fishing boats, packs of killer whales. They seem to know, like the fishermen, that inshore channels concentrate the schools of returning salmon. Of all marine mammals, killer whales are among the noisiest. They rise and fall, at times swimming upside down, simply mouthing the fish and seeming to play with them in sport. And those salmon that survive the killer whales may yet have to run the gauntlet of hungry seals. Fleeing in terror, our tagged fish seek shelter. Strange rocks, shadows, safety. She senses danger. She must swim away from the taste of death. The seal was not so lucky. It has drowned, caught in a net lost by a fishing boat. The millions of sockeye salmon returning to the Fraser River system spend several weeks waiting in the sea before starting to run up the river. And there we will leave them for a time and follow the fortunes of other salmon that have already started to enter some of the more northerly rivers. 
All along the jagged coastline from Oregon to Alaska, where over a thousand rivers meet the sea, groups of salmon are hurrying into fresh water toward their spawning grounds. They find by smell the water of their parent rivers, which they left when they set out to sea as smolts. After the turmoil of the open sea, the clear water of a beautiful river flowing through uncut forest seems to offer peace and tranquility. Roots of standing timber control the runoff of heavy rain and protect the river banks. Fallen trunks make nursery pools for tiny fish. But no natural environment, however congenial, offers total security. There's always something lurking. This black bear seems to know exactly where to catch a fish. It doesn't hurry, just takes its time, and then quietly chooses the fish it wants. That extraordinary skill must be the envy of any fisherman. All too commonly, years ago, logging was a business of heedless devastation, and sometimes it still is. Hill slopes stripped of timber to a river's bank. Breeding stretches filled with trash. Logs dragged across spawning gravel, which often is dredged for road building. Every river is a potential salmon producer. But however clean the water, no stream is of much value if obstructed, or if its bottom is so heavily silted that salmon eggs die for lack of oxygen. Fattened on the rich feeding grounds of the sea, these salmon are ready for their upstream battle. This unpolluted northern stream holding a run of migrating pink salmon is an example of a paradise that man's hand has not yet destroyed. Of course, there's no shortage of natural danger. The chance of any individual fish ever reaching the spawning grounds hundreds of miles upstream appears very slight. Even the vegetarian beaver can sometimes cause fatal problems if it builds its dam in an awkward spot. In this case, the dam has divided the channel so that some salmon have swung into a side stream running through a marsh, totally unsuitable for spawning fish, but a splendid opportunity for local bears.
Bears only occasionally use their paws for catching salmon. They usually bite them and carry them out in their jaws. This fish still has its sea coating of silver, but an astonishing change of coloration takes place soon after sockeye salmon leave the ocean. The fish this bear was chasing has turned red. All the sockeyes at spawning time will have similar scarlet skins and pale green heads. For the bears, the salmon in this backwater are easy prey. But overall, such losses are minimal. The ability of fish to withstand fatigue is the key to their successful upstream migration. Rapids are dangerous to salmon for more than one reason. During times of mass migration, shallow water makes easy pickings for grizzly bear families. They gorge themselves, but continue to kill, fascinated by the abundance of fish. But on this Alaskan river, bears are not the only hunters to line the banks. Sport fishing is big business when the sockeye run is on. In the rivers of North America, millions of Pacific salmon are hurrying upstream. They have swum the ocean for thousands of miles during an absence of several years. And to us, the timing and coordination of their return seems nothing short of miraculous. Inevitably, leaping salmon suffer many losses due to the battering they receive when forced back against the rocks. Man-made obstacles, such as weirs built to channel stream flow, are especially dangerous.
Some obstacles are impassable. So-called killer dams, fashioned without adequate fish passes, can destroy complete runs of salmon. This is another man-made obstacle that stretches from bank to bank, a seemingly insurmountable barrier to the teeming sockeye. In fact, it's used as a fish counter so that an accurate tally can be made of each year's spawning run. Here, the sockeyes are lining up to get through the counting gate. This strange looking device is no longer used for killing. It's an old Indian type of fishing wheel designed for scooping up salmon. It still scoops them up, but now for the aid of fishery scientists who use the wheel for fish tagging. The fish are tagged here and their progress upstream monitored. Researchers can then assess the importance of various spawning areas throughout the river system. Beside this huge dam, a successful fish ladder has been built that gives the returning salmon a comparatively easy run-up, stage by stage, through a series of tiny concrete pools. Set into the wall of the ladder is a glass-fronted viewing room, which offers the public a sight of the running fish. Some of the sockeyes bear signs of dramatic encounters with seals or sharks. This one had an amazingly lucky escape, although it seems doubtful that it could fight its way through the fearsome rapids of Hell's Gate Canyon on the Fraser River, where we rejoin our own run of sockeyes.
she swims against the strong current, driven. She must move on. Fishways have been built at Hell's Gate to enable the migrating salmon to avoid the rapids. But on this occasion, the river is so low that the fishways are dry and can't help the returning run of sockeye to get through the narrow gap. The fish have collected here in schools where they rest for a time behind a rocky outcrop. But sooner or later, through that rush of water, they have to get around those boulders. The current on the far side is tremendous. The fish are gasping, many of them dying in the struggle. But sockeye salmon are very strong swimmers, and fortunately, although the run is spread out, many fish finally get through in good shape. The sockeye continue upstream through Fraser Canyon, a great thoroughfare both for salmon and for man. A major highway runs through it and two railways. Twenty miles above Hell's Gate, our fish enter the confluence of the Fraser and the Thompson Rivers. Some salmon move left and take the Fraser River. The others, our fish, take the right fork and head into the Thompson. This water's familiar. Strange shapes menace again. But she's close to home. She must keep moving. Four years ago, the fish came down that rushing river as youngsters. Now they're returning as adults. And with them, we can see a tagged fish that looks like a female. Here, the river is still strong flowing, but the water is clean and sweet, and the fish are nearly at their journey's end. Traveling about 18 to 20 miles a day, they swim on out of the fast-flowing Thompson River into the still water of Shuswap Lake. She's made it to the lake. Others will never leave it. Soon, the fish reach the delta of the Adams River. Now, along the wooded banks, the sockeye mass in huge schools. 
Despite the arduous journey from the Fraser estuary, most of the fish are in surprisingly good condition. All of the fish are red now, the males with humped backs, big hooked jaws, and huge teeth. Among the sockeyes are a few Chinook salmon, big fish, now turned black. They usually spawn earlier, and often their eggs are dug out by the nest-building sockeyes due to the competition for spawning space. So that in this river system, the run of Chinooks is very limited. There's a traveling line of sockeye stretching from the Adams River 300 miles back to the sea. And as more and more fish arrive, people have started to gather. On each of its prolific four-year cycles, the Adams River run is a great public attraction. Over the next few weeks, up to a quarter of a million people will visit this spot. They call it the salute to the sockeye, and it's brought about by sheer wonderment. There's no disturbance of the salmon, no fishing. Fascinated by the sockeye story, people just come to watch these legendary fish at the end of their epic journey. Now intent only on mating, the fish take no notice of the people. They just lie milling together in great schools until the moment comes to pair up and disperse. Then the females start to dig the nests in which they'll lay their eggs. Strange shapes no longer threaten. After four years, she's finally home. Everything is ready. Very soon, pairs of fish occupy every part of the seven and a half mile long Adams River. There's a lot of jealous fighting among the males. Their big teeth haven't been grown for feeding. The fish stopped feeding long ago, before they entered the river. The great jaws are used just for fighting and display. It seems extraordinary that after living off their own body fats during such a tremendous journey, they still have the energy to swim at such a speed. But the urge to find a mate and fulfill their destiny is indomitable. When a pair of salmon get together, they dig a nest in the gravel with a sideways flapping action of the tail. A series of nests is made, and the female will lay in each one until all her eggs are gone. They are instantly fertilized by milt from the male fish. All Pacific salmon die after spawning. Of the millions of fish, not one lives to spawn again. On average, death comes 10 days after spawning starts. Some fish have already spawned and drift away to die. Newcomers arrive among decaying carcasses strewn along the bottom. But this grotesque mask of death is no disaster. Nature wastes nothing. 
In time, nutrients from these dead bodies will wash downstream into the lake, where one day, young salmon will thrive on the remains of their own parents. Here, a pleasant surprise. At least one of the salmon we saw tagged at sea has survived the journey home. Very soon, like all the others, she will stare sightless at the sky. But the task she returned to do will be accomplished. Soon, the fertilized eggs of future generations will lie buried in the gravel. She is finished. She has succeeded in escaping death, only to find it here, where she was born. Yet, she dies in triumph, her task complete. We can only guess at the reasons for this fantastic cycle of life and death. But the sockeye's future, like that of other species, is entirely in our hands. If overfishing, river blockage, and pollution can be controlled, then in each buried egg, new life will always tremble in the spring. And nature will continue to perform her miracle of the scarlet salmon. Nature is made possible by public television stations. By Siemens, a leader in high technology electronics and electrical engineering. Nationwide, 27,000 Americans in 400 locations. The name is Siemens. And by your gas company and America's gas industry, developing ways to use gas more efficiently for more than 160 million people across America.